Chapter 11 of Buried Alive by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 11. An Escape. One night in the following June, Priam and Addis refrained from going to bed. Addis dozed for an hour or so on the sofa, and Priam read by her side in an easy chair, and, about two o'clock just before the first beginnings of dawn, they stimulated themselves into a feverish activity beneath the parlour gas. Alice prepared tea, bread and butter, and eggs, passing briskly from room to room. Alice also ran upstairs, cast a few more things into a valise and a bag already partially packed, and, locking both receptacles, carried them downstairs. Meantime, the hull of Priam's energy was employed in having a bath and in shaving. Blood was shed, as was but natural at that ineffable hour. While Priam consumed the food she prepared, Alice was continually darting to and fro in the house. At one moment, after an absence, she would come into the parlour with a mouthful of hatpins. At another, she would rush out to assure herself that the indispensable keys of the valise and the bag with her purse were on the umbrella stand, where they could not be forgotten. Between her excursions, she would drink thirty drops of tea. Now, Priam, she said at length, the water's hot. Haven't you finished? It'll be getting light soon. Water hot? he queried at a loss. Yes, she said, to wash up these things, of course. You don't suppose I'm going to leave a lot of dirty things in the house, do you? While I'm doing that, you might stick labels on the luggage. They won't need to be labelled, he argued. We shall take them with us in the carriage. Oh, Priam, she protested, how tiresome you are. I have travelled more than you have, he tried to laugh. Yes, and fine travelling it must have been too. However, if you don't mind the luggage being lost, I don't. During this, she was collecting the crockery on a tray, with which tray she whizzed out of the room. In ten minutes, hatted, heavily veiled and gloved, she cautiously opened the front door and peeped forth into the lamp-lit street. She peered to right and to left. Then she went as far as the gate and peered again. Is it all right? whispered Priam, who was behind her. Yes, I think so, she whispered. Priam came out of the house with the bag in one hand and the valise in the other, a pipe in his mouth, a stick under his arm, and an overcoat on his shoulder. Alice ran up the steps, gazed within the house, pulled the door to silently, and locked it. Then, beneath the summer stars, she and Priam hastened furtively, as though the luggage had contained swag, up Werta Road towards Oxford Road. When they turned the corner, they felt very much relieved. They had escaped. It was their second attempt. The first, made in daylight, had completely failed. Their cab had been followed to Paddington Station by three other cabs containing the representatives and the cameras of three Sunday newspapers. A journalist had deliberately accompanied Priam to the booking office, had heard him ask for two seconds to Weymouth, and had bought a second to Weymouth himself. They had gone to Weymouth. But, as within two hours of their arrival, Weymouth had become even more impossible than Werter Road, they had ignominiously, but wisely, come back. Werter Road had developed into the most celebrated thoroughfare in London. Its photograph had appeared in scores of newspapers, with a cross marking the abode of Priam and Alice. It was beset and infested by journalists of several nationalities from morn till night. Cameras were as common in it as lampposts and a famous descriptive reporter of the Sunday News had got lodgings, at a high figure, exactly opposite number 29. Priam and Alice could do nothing without publicity. And if it would be an exaggeration to assert that evening papers appeared with stock press news, 5.40 and Mrs. Leake went out shopping, the exaggeration would not be very extravagant. For a fortnight, Priam had not been beyond the door during daylight. It was Alice who, alarmed by Priam's padded cheeks and tightened nerves, had devised the plan of flight before the early summer dawn. They reached East Putney Station, of which the gates were closed, the first workman's train being not yet due. And there they stood. Not another human being was abroad. Only the clock of St. Bude's was faithfully awakening every soul within a radius of two hundred yards each quarter of an hour. Then a porter came and opened the gate, it was still exceedingly early, and Priam booked for Waterloo in triumph. Oh, cried Alice as they mounted the stairs, I quite forgot to draw up the blinds at the front of the house. And she stopped on the stairs. 
What did you want to draw up the blinds for? If they're down, everybody will know instantly that we've gone, whereas if I... She began to descend the stairs. Alice, he said sharply, in a strange voice. The muscles of his white face were drawn. What? Well, damn the blinds. Come along, or upon my soul I'll kill you. She realised that his nerves were in active insurrection, and that a mere nothing might bring about the fall of the government. How oh, very well, she soothed him by her amiable obedience. In a quarter of an hour they were safely lost in the wilderness of Waterloo, and the newspaper train bore them off to Bournemouth for a few days' respite. The Nation's Curiosity The interest of the United Kingdom in the unique case of Witt v. Parfitts had already reached apparently the highest possible degree of intensity, and there was reason for the Kingdom's passionate curiosity. Whitney Witt, the plaintiff, had come over to England with its eccentricities, his retinue, his extreme wealth and his failing eyesight, specially to fight Parfitts. A half-pathetic figure, this white-haired man, once a connoisseur, who from mere habit continued to buy expensive pictures when he could no longer see them. Whitney Witt was implacably set against Parfitts because he was convinced that Mr Oxford had sought to take advantage of his blindness. There he was, conducting his action regardless of expense. His apartments and his regal daily existence at the Grand Babylon alone cost a fabulous sum, which may be precisely ascertained by references to illustrated articles in the papers. Then Mr Oxford, the youngish Jew who had acquired Parfitts, who was Parfitts, also cut a picturesque figure on the face of London. He too was spending money with both hands, for Parfitts itself was at stake. Last, and most disturbing, was the individual looming mysteriously in the background, the inexplicable man who lived in Werter Road, and whose identity would be decided by the judgment in the case of Witt v. Parfitts. If Witt won his action, then Parfitts might retire from business. Mr Oxford would probably go to prison for having sold goods on false pretenses, and the name of Henry Leake, valet, would be added to the list of adventurous scoundrels who have pretended to be their masters. But... If which should lose, then what a complication and what further enigmas to be solved. If which should lose, the national funeral of Priam Fowl had been a fraudulent farce. A common valet lay under the hallowed stones of the abbey, and Europe had mourned in vain. If which should lose, a gigantic and unprecedented swindle had been practised upon the nation. Then the question would arise, why? Hence, it was not surprising that popular interest, nourished by an indefatigable and an excessively enterprising press, should have mounted till no one would have believed that it would mount any more. But the evasion from Werter Road on that June morning intensified the interest enormously. Of course, owing to the drawn blinds, it soon became known, and the bloodhounds of the Sunday papers were sniffing along the platforms of all the termini in London. Priam's departure greatly prejudiced the cause of Mr Oxford, especially when the bloodhounds failed and Priam persisted in his invisibility. If a man was an honest man, why should he flee the public gaze and in the night? There was but a step from the posing of this question to the inevitable inference that Mr Oxford's line of defence was really too fantastic for credence. Certainly organs of vast circulation, while repeating that, as the action was sub judice, they could say nothing about it, had already tried the action several times in their impartial columns, and they now tried it again with the entire public as jury. And in three days, Priam had definitely become a criminal in the public eye, a criminal flying from justice. Useless to assert that he was simply a witness subpoenaed to give evidence of the trial, he had transgressed the unwritten law of the English Constitution that a person prominent in a cause célèbre belongs for the time being not to himself, but to the nation at large. He had no claim to privacy. In surreptitiously obtaining seclusion, he was merely robbing the public and the public's press of their inalienable right. Who could deny now the reiterated statement that he was a bigamist? It came to be said that he must be on his way to South America. Then the public read avidly articles by specially retained barristers on the extradition treaters with Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, Chile, Paraguay and Uruguay. The curates, Matthew and Henry, preached to crowded congregations at Putney and Bermondsey and were reported verbatim in the Christian Voice Sermon Supplement, 
and other messengers of light. And gradually the nose of England bent closer and closer to its newspaper of a morning, and coffee went cold and bacon fat congealed from the Isle of Wight to Hexham, while the latest rumours were being swallowed. It promised to be stupendous to the case of Wit v. Parfitts. It promised to be one of those cases that alone makes life worth living, that alone compensates for the horrors of climate in England. And then the day of hearing arrived, and the afternoon papers which appear at nine o'clock in the morning announced that Henry Leake, or Priam Fahl, according to your wish, and his wife, or his female companion and willing victim, had returned to Werter Road. And England held its breath, and even Scotland paused expectant, and Ireland stirred in its Celtic dream. Mention of Two Moles The theatre in which the emotional drama of Wit v. Parfitts was to be played lacked the usual characteristics of a modern place of entertainment. It was far too high for its width and breadth. It was badly illuminated. It was draughty in winter and stuffy in summer, being completely deprived of ventilation. Had it been under the control of the county council, it would have been instantly condemned as dangerous in case of fire, for its gangways were always encumbered and its exits of a medieval complexity. It had no stage, no footlights, and all its seats were of naked wood, except one. This unique seat was occupied by the principal player, who wore a humorous wig and a brilliant and expensive scarlet costume. He was a fairly able judge, but he had mistaken his vocation. His rare talent for making third-rate jokes would have brought him a fortune in the world of musical comedy. His salary was a hundred a week. Better comedians have earned less. On the present occasion, he was in the midst of a double row of fashionable hats, and beneath the hats were the faces of fourteen feminine relatives and acquaintances. These hats performed the function of dressing the house. The principal player endeavoured to behave as though under the illusion that he was alone in his glory, but he failed. There were four other leading actors, Mr Pennington KC and Mr Vaudry KC engaged by the plaintiff, and Mr Cass KC and Mr Crepitude KC engaged by the defendant. These artistes were the stars of their profession, nominally less glittering, but really far more glittering than the player in Scarlet. Their wigs were of inferior quality to his, and their costumes shabby, but they did not mind, for whereas he got a hundred a week, they each got a hundred a day. Three junior performers received ten guineas a day apiece. One of them held a watching brief for the dean and chapter of the abbey, who, being members of a Christian fraternity, were pained and horrified by the defendant's implication that they had given interment to a valet, and who were determined to resist exhumation by all hazard. The supers in the drama, whose business it was to whisper to each other and to the players, consisted of solicitors, solicitors, clerks, and experts. Their combined emoluments worked out at the rate of £150 a day. Twelve excellent men in the jury box received between them about as much as would have kept a KC alive for five minutes. The total expenses for production thus amounted to something like six or seven hundred pounds a day. The preliminary expenses had run into several thousands. The enterprise could have been made remunerative by hiring for it Covent Garden Theatre and selling stalls as for Tetrazzini and Caruso. But in the absurd auditorium chosen, crammed though it was to the perilous doors, the loss was necessarily terrific. Fortunately, the affair was subsidised, not merely by the state, but also by those two wealthy capitalists, Whitney C. Witt and Mr. Oxford, and therefore the management were in a position to ignore paltry financial considerations and to practise art for art's sake. In opening the case, Mr. Pennington KC gave instant proof of his astounding histrionic powers. He began calmly, colloquially, treating the jury as friends of his boyhood, and the judge as a gifted uncle, and stating in simple language that Whitney C. Witt was claiming £72,000 from the defendant, money paid for worthless pictures palmed off upon the myopic and venerable plaintiff as martyr species. He recounted the life and death of the great painter Priam Fahl, and his solemn burial amid the tears of the whole world. He dwelt upon the genius of Priam Fahl, and then upon the confiding nature of the plaintiff. Then he inquired, 
Who could blame the plaintiff for his confidence in the uprightness of a firm with such a name as Parfitt's? And then he explained by what accident of a dating stamp on a canvas it had been discovered that the pictures guaranteed to be by Priam Fall were painted after Priam Fall's death. He proceeded with no variation of tone. The explanation is simplicity itself. Priam Fall was not really dead. It was his valet who died, quite naturally, quite comprehensively. The great genius Priam Fall wished to pass the remainder of his career as a humble valet. He deceived everybody. The doctor, his cousin, Mr. Duncan Fall, the public authorities, the dean and chapter of the Abbey of the Nation. In fact, the entire world. As Henry Deke, he married. And as Henry Deke, he recommended the art of painting in Putney. He carried on the vacation several years without arousing the suspicions of a single person. And then, by a curious coincidence immediately after my client threatened an action against the defendant, he displayed himself in his true identity as Priam Fowl. Such is the simple explanation, said Pennington KC, and added, which you will hear presently from the defendant. Doubtless it will commend itself to you as experienced men of the world. You cannot but have perceived that such things are constantly happening in real life, that they are of daily occurrence. I am almost ashamed to stand up before you and endeavour to rebut a story so plausible and so essentially convincing. I feel that my task is well-nigh hopeless. Nevertheless, I must do my best. And so on. It was one of his greatest feats in the kind of irony that appeals to a jury, and the audience deemed that the case was already virtually decided. After Witnessy Witt and his secretary had been called and had filled the court with the echoing twang of New York, the controlled fury of the aged Witt was highly effective, Mrs. Henry Leake was invited to the witness box. She was supported thither by her two curates, who, however, could not prevent her from weeping at the stern voice of the usher. She related her marriage. "'Is that your husband?' demanded Vaudry, K.C., who had now assumed the principal role, Pennington, K.C., being engaged in another play, in another theatre, pointing with one of his well-conceived dramatic gestures to Priam Fowl. "'It is,' sobbed Mrs. Henry Leake. The unhappy creature believed what she said, and the curates, though silent, made a deep impression on the jury. In cross-examination, when crepitude K.C. forced her to admit that on first meeting Priam in his house in Werter Road she had not been quite sure of his identity, she replied, It's all come over me since. Shouldn't a woman recognise the father of her own children? She should, interpolated the judge. There was a difference of opinion as to whether his word was jocular or not. Mrs. Henry Leake was a touching figure, but not amusing. It was Mr. Duncan Farl who quite unintentionally supplied the first relief. Duncan pooh-poohed the possibility of Priam being Priam. He detailed all the circumstances that followed the death in Selwood Terrace, and showed in fifty ways that Priam could not have been Priam. The man now masquerading as Priam was not even a gentleman, whereas Priam was Duncan's cousin. Duncan was an excellent witness, dry, precise, imperturbable. Under cross-examination by Crepitude, he had to describe particularly his boyish meeting with Priam. Mr. Crepitude was not inquisitive. Tell us what occurred, said Crepitude. Well, we fought. Oh, you fought. What did you two naughty boys fight about? Great laughter. About a plum cake, I think. Oh, not a seed cake, a plum cake. Great laughter. I think a plum cake. And what was the result of this sanguinary encounter? Great laughter. My cousin loosened one of my teeth. Great laughter in which the court joined. And what did you do to him? I'm afraid I didn't do much. I remember tearing half his clothes off. Roars of laughter in which everyone joined, except Priam and Duncan Fowle. There, you're sure you remember that? You're sure that it wasn't he who tore your clothes off? Lots of hysteric laughter. Yes, said Duncan, coldly dreaming in the past. His eyes had the faraway look as he added, I remember now that my cousin had two little moles on his neck below the collar. I seem to remember seeing them. I've just thought of it. There is, of course, when it is mentioned in a theatre, something exorbitantly funny about even one mole. Two moles together brought the house down. 
Mr. Crepitude leaned over to a solicitor in front of him. The solicitor leaned aside to a solicitor's clerk, and the solicitor's clerk whispered to Priam Fowle, who nodded. Er, uh, Mr. Crepitude was beginning again, but he stopped and said to Duncan Fowle, Thank you. You can step down. Then a witness named Giustini, a cashier at the Hotel de Paris Monte Carlo, swore that Priam Fowle, the renowned painter, had spent four days in the Hotel de Paris one hot May seven years ago, and that the person in the court whom the defendant stated to be Priam Fowle was not that man. No cross-examination could shake Mr. Giustini. Following him came the manager of the Hotel Belvedere at Mount Pellerin near Vevey, Switzerland, who related a similar tale and was equally unshaken. And after that, the pictures themselves were brought in, and the experts came after them, and technical evidence was begun. Scarcely had it begun when a clock struck and the performance ended for the day. The principal actors doffed their costumes and snatched up the evening papers to make sure that the descriptive reporters had been as eulogistic of them as usual. The judge, who subscribed to a press-cutting agency, was glad to find the next morning that none of his jokes had been admitted by any of the nineteen chief London dailies. And the Strand and Piccadilly were quick with wit fee parfits, on evening posters and in the strident mouths of newsboys. The telegraph wires vibrated to wit v. parfits. In the great betting industrial towns of the provinces, wages were laid at scientific prices. England, in a word, was content, and the principal actors had the right to be content also. Very astute people in clubs and saloon bars talked darkly about those two moles, and Priam's nod in response to the whispers of the solicitor's clerk. Such details do not escape the modern sketch-writer at a thousand a year. To very astute people, the two moles appeared to promise pretty things. Priam's Refusal Leak in the box. This legend got itself onto the telegraph wires and the placards within a few minutes of Priam's taking the oath. It sent a shiver of anticipation throughout the country. Three days have passed since the opening of the case, for actors engaged at a hundred a day for the run of the piece do not crack whips behind experts engaged at ten or twenty a day. The pace had therefore been dignified, and England wanted a Philip. Nobody, except Alice, knew what to expect from Priam. Alice knew. She knew that Priam was in an extremely peculiar state which might lead to extremely peculiar results, and she knew also there was nothing to be done with him. She herself had made one little effort to bathe him in the light of reason. The effort had not succeeded. She saw the danger of renewing it. Pennington KC, by the way, insisted that she should leave the court during Priam's evidence. Priam's attitude towards the whole case was one of bitter resentment, a resentment now hot, now cold. He had the strongest possible objection to the entire affair. He hated wit as keenly as he hated Oxford. All that he demanded from the world was peace and quietness, and the world would not grant him these inexpensive commodities. He had not asked to be buried in Westminster Abbey. His interment had been forced upon him. And if he chose to call himself by another name, why should he not do so? If he chose to marry a simple woman and live in a suburb and paint pictures at ten pounds each, why should he not do so? Why should he be dragged out of his tranquillity because two persons in whom he felt no interest whatever had quarrelled over his pictures? Why should his life have been made unbearable in Putney by the extravagant curiosity of a mob of journalists? And then, why should he be compelled, by means of a piece of blue paper, to go through the frightful ordeal and flame of publicity in a witness box? That was the crowning unmerited torture, the unthinkable horror which had broken his sleep for many nights. In the box, he certainly had all the appearance of a trapped criminal, with his nervous movements, his restless, lowered eyes, and his faint, hard voice that he could scarcely fetch up from his throat. Nervousness lined with resentment forms excellent material for the plastic art of a cross-examination counsel, and Pennington, K.C., itched to be at work. Creptitude, K.C., Oxford's counsel, was in less joyous mood. Priam was Creptitude's own witness, and yet a horrible witness, a witness who had consistently and ferociously declined to open his mouth until he was in the box. Assuredly he had nodded in response to the whispered question of the solicitor's clerk, 
but he had not confirmed the nod, nor breathed a word of assistance during the three days of the trial. He had merely sat there, blazing, in silence. "'Your name is Priam Fowl?' began Creptitude. "'It is,' said Priam sullenly, and with all the external characteristics of a liar. At intervals he glanced surreptitiously at the judge, as though the judge had been a bomb with a lighted fuse. The examination started badly, and it went from worse to worse. The idea that this craven, prevaricating figure in the box could be the illustrious, the world-renowned Priam Fowl seemed absurd. Creptitude had to exercise all his self-control in order not to bully Priam. And that is all, said Creptitude, after Priam had given his preposterous and halting explanations of the strange phenomena of his life after the death of Leek. None of these carried conviction. He merely said that the woman Leek was mistaken in misidentifying him as her husband. He inferred that she was hysterical. This inference alienated him from the audience completely. His statement that he had no definite reason for pretending to be Leek, that it was an impasse of the moment, was received with mute derision. His explanation, when questioned as to the evidence of the hotel officials, that more than once his valet Leek had gone about impersonating his master, seemed grotesquely inadequate. People wondered why Crepitude had made no reference to the moles. The fact was, Crepitude was afraid to refer to the moles. In mentioning the moles to Priam, he might be staking all to lose all. However, Pennington KC alluded to the moles, but not until he had conclusively proved to the judge in a cross-examination of two hours' duration that Priam knew nothing of Priam's own youth, nor of painting, nor of the world of painters. He made a sad mess of Priam, and Priam's voice grew fainter and fainter, and his gestures more and more self-incriminating. Pennington, KC, achieved one or two brilliant little effects. Now you say you went with the defendant to his club, and that he told you of the difficulty he was in. Yes. Did he make you any offer of money? Yes. Now, what did he offer you? Thirty-six thousand pounds. Sensation in court. So, and what was this thirty-six thousand pounds to be for? I don't know. You don't know? Come now. I don't know. You accepted the offer? No, I refused it. Sensation in court. Why did you refuse it? Because I didn't care to accept it. Then no money passed between you that day? Yes, five hundred pounds. What for? A picture. The same kind of picture that you've been selling for ten pounds? Yes. So that on the very day that the defendant wanted you to swear that you were Priam Fowl, the price of your pictures rose from ten pounds to five hundred? Yes. Doesn't that strike you as odd? Yes. You still say, my leak, you are on your oath. You still say that you refused £36,000 in order to accept 500 I sold a picture for 500 On the placards in the Strand. Severe cross-examination of leak. Now about the encounter with Mr Duncan Fowle. Of course, if you are really a prime Fowle, you remember all about that. Yes. What age were you? I don't know, about nine. No, you were about nine. A suitable age for cake. Great laughter. Now, Mr Duncan Fowle says you loosed one of his teeth. I did. And that he tore your clothes. I dare say. He says he remembered the fact because you had two moles. Yes. Have you two moles? Yes. Immense sensation. Pennington paused. Where are they? On my neck, just below my collar. Kindly place your hand at the spot. Priam did so. The excitement was terrific. Pennington again paused, but, convinced that Priam was an impostor, he sarcastically proceeded, Perhaps, if I am not asking you too much, you will take your collar off and show the two bowls to the court? No said Priam stoutly, and for the first time he looked Pennington in the face. You would prefer to do it perhaps in his lordship's room, if his lordship consents. I won't do it anywhere, my lord, Priam repeated loudly. 
all his resentment surged up once more, and particularly his resentment against the little army of experts who pronounced his pictures to be clever but worthless imitations of himself. If his pictures, admittedly painted after his supposed death, could not prove his identity, if his word was to be flouted by insulting and bewigged beasts of prey, then his moles should not prove his identity. He resolved upon obstinacy. The witness, gentlemen, said Pennington K.C., in triumph to the, to the jury, has two moles on his neck exactly as described by Mr. Duncan Fowle, but he will not display them. Eleven legal minds bent nobly to the problem whether the law and justice of England could compel a free man to take his collar off if he refused to take his collar off. In the meantime, of course, the case had to proceed. The six or seven hundred pounds a day must be earned, and there were various other witnesses. The next witness was Alice. End of chapter 10